Father, we're so grateful to be gathered together as your people in your presence. And Lord, what an incredible privilege it is to have and to hold your word, to know that you have not left us to ourselves to sort out this life on our own, but you guide and instruct and cultivate relationship with us through it. And so, Lord, as we open it now, we pray that you would speak by the power of your Holy Spirit to our hearts and lives so that we would be transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Open your Bible with me to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. We just started last week a new series called New Life. Uh, Colossians 2, 8. I think it's 2.8, says, as you received Christ the Lord, so walk in him. And so that's our aim for the next few months as we study this book together. And last week, Paul told this young church, the Colossian church, what he sees God doing in them. And so if you remember, we talked a little bit about that, about what it means to, to identify what God's doing in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. And I gave you a little homework. I said, uh, tell God, thank God for what he's doing in you, what he has done in you. And take a moment to, to tell other people how God used them in your life to do those things. So uh, it's not too late. Uh, if you haven't gotten around to that this week, you can still do it. Uh, take time this week to give thanks to God for what he has done in you. And look somebody in the eye who had a hand in that and tell them thank you as well. But as we uh, turn the page from uh, the last week's text to this one, which we'll start in verse 9, um, that was about thanksgiving for what God has already done. Now Paul will move from prayers of thanksgiving to what we might call prayers of petition. He begins to ask God for things. Uh, and he begins to describe what he has been praying God will do. Let's read it, verse 9 through 14. <clears throat> And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins." So as I said, as Paul opens this letter, he moves from giving thanks for what God's already done to telling them what he's praying God will do. And as he does, you may have heard in these phrases, he's indicating what the Colossians should be aiming for in the Christian life. And they remain things you and I should be aiming for in our Christian lives as well. And it raises this question, how does a person please God. What does that mean? What does that look like? How do I please God? Now, that's an important question, but it's one that actually we might be a little uncomfortable with. Uh, Christians know or should know that we are made acceptable to God by faith alone in Christ alone, not because of our works, but in fact, in fact despite them. So, of course, this is true, that we are uh, declared righteous by God on the basis of Christ's atoning work alone. But it is also true that the way in which we live our lives can be viewed by God positively or negatively. That's a little uncomfortable to think about maybe sometimes. But God's posture towards us as our heavenly father, as we live our Christian lives, um, the way we relate to this, I think, can be helpful to think about the posture of a good and loving earthly father. A good human father will love his children no matter what. He is entirely committed to their good regardless of their behavior. 
He is their father and nothing can change that because the basis of his relationship with his child is fixed. It's not uh, determined by the nature of how that child behaves. But one of the ways a loving and good father expresses that love is actually by showing that he is either pleased or displeased by certain behavior. If you um, are not super familiar with this, just volunteer for children's ministry. Uh, Hang out with some toddlers for a couple of hours. Uh, As a parent, if your child steals from another kid, and then they look over at you to see what you're going to think about it, and your countenance displays that you are pleased by that, that not only is not helpful to the child that just got something taken from them, it's actually not forming your child well. We want our disposition as loving fathers to be a, a, a one of, of delight and pleasure when children act according to what honors God and a kind of, of displeasure when they behave in ways that don't. And the opposite of that kind of uh, engaged love is not hate, it's indifference. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, if those of you who are parents, but uh, the easiest thing in the world is to not care, right? <laughs> Just to change the channel and kind of continue on regardless of the behavior of your kids. That's, uh, that's as easy as rolling off a log. The hard work is actually to engage and, and to communicate at times through your uh, demeanor what is right and wrong. Now, of course, that illustration definitely uh, breaks down at a certain point. Because human fathers, we don't always have our hearts calibrated rightly with God's. And so sometimes, because uh, we are human beings and not God, we can send the wrong signals at the wrong times. And not only that, but of course, we don't always communicate our displeasure the right ways. But that is not the case with God. He does not leave us to sort of decipher his perspective based on his moods. He tells us plainly in his word. And that's what he does here in Colossians 1, 9 to 14. Now in Greek, uh, these five verses are one long, complicated, dense sentence. Um, I know I kind of complimented Paul's writing last week. This week he might get a little smack on the hand from his English teacher because this is a serious run-on sentence. Um, But he's got a lot to communicate in this one big run-on sentence sentence. And the summary is what he starts with, and then he's got several phrases that flesh it out. And the summary of it is in verse 10. He says, Paul is praying that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Now, when Paul says walk, of course, he's not talking about the Colossian stride, right? He's talking about the way they live. And this is actually a very common, ancient uh, Jewish way of talking about a way of life. And so as we walk through life, our aim ought to be as Christians to do so in a manner that is fully pleasing to God. So the unofficial title of today's message is Walk This Way. But if that gets, thinking, gets you thinking about songs you don't want to think about, then uh, the official title is Signs of a Life Pleasing to God. Signs of a life pleasing to God. A Christian fully living out their new life in Christ, according to this passage, is someone who is growing in God's will, who is being strengthened by God's power, and is giving thanks for God's grace. First up, growing in God's will. Signs of a life pleasing to God is that you are growing in God's will. Verse 10 says, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Paul starts off with with, uh, language to describe this kind of life worthy of the the Lord with an agricultural uh, metaphor. He draws from that world. Now, um, here in Montgomery County in 2024, we have varying degrees of familiarity with this world. But if maybe during uh, the COVID regulation uh, shutdown season, maybe some of you took up some gardening. Maybe you tried to grow something that grows with a vine. 
tomato, or maybe you've been to a vineyard and you've seen uh, grapevines growing. When I was growing up, my grandfather uh, had about 60 acres and he planted about five of those and rows and rows and rows of that was beans. And uh, one of the things he would do every year is he would put out posts and run strings from post to post right over the place where he planted those seeds. And so that as they grew, they would have something to attach onto that would sort of guide their growth. You do the same thing with tomatoes. You do the same things with grapes. Because it's possible for those plants to advance and grow in a sense, but to grow in the wrong ways and wrong directions that are actually harmful for them long term. It's important that they actually grow in a particular direction. And so Paul uses that analogy to say we have these these posts in the Christian life that guide the direction of our growth. Now, note that uh, what he refers to that we ought to be doing is growing. He says we are bearing fruit in good works and we are increasing ought to be in the knowledge of God. That indicates that a person uh, who's growing in a manner that pleases the Lord isn't kind of rotting on the vine. Uh, They aren't stagnating. They are growing. And so the picture is not one of perfection, but one of progress. If you decide to get into gardening this week, and one day this spring you plant a seed, and you go to bed that night, and you wake up and expect that the next morning you will have a fully developed crop Prepare yourself to be very disappointed. It is no different in the Christian life. Paul doesn't say that a life pleasing to the Lord is a life of perfection. He says it's a life of progress. That it's a life that is increasing, that is bearing fruit in a particular direction. And the direction, he says, it ought to be growing, uh, sort of the posts on either side of the growing Christian life is in the knowledge of of God and in good works. Increasingly understanding who he is and what he wants of us and then obeying him and then doing it. Uh, I remember one night uh, many years ago now putting one of my daughters to bed and I think she was about six years old. And uh, she, just as I was about to turn out the light, she said, hey dad, can we talk for a second? I thought, wow, okay, my six-year-old is like, Dad, can we have a talk? You know, and okay, this is the moments you're looking for, right, Dads? And so you stopped for a second, and I got down and knelt down by the bed, and she said, I have two things. Okay, we have an agenda for this meeting. All right, here we go. And she said, um, first, I'm having a hard time believing the miracles in the Bible. Okay, thanks for telling me. Okay, let's talk about that. Now, what's the second one? Um, I'm having a real hard time giving my money at church. Thank you, Jose, for your little, um, you know, spiel on that. Um, so it's every night, you know, we'd open up this little Jesus storybook Bible and we'd read to her and it got to all the stories about Jesus doing these crazy things she had never seen anybody do before. And she just thought, I don't know how to, I don't know what to make of that. And then we were also trying to help her just learn how to be a good steward of the money that God was coming into her so she'd learn how to do it later. And so every time mom or uh, grandma gave her a dollar, you know, 80 cents went in the spending jar and 10 cents went in the savings jar and 10 cents went in the giving jar. And then once, you know, there was a critical mass in the giving jar, we'd bring that thing to church and she would, you know, dump it in the offering. And my six-year-old daughter was beginning to struggle growing in those directions. Um, Now, by the grace of God, many years later, she is not where she once was. Uh, She has come to trust in Jesus and love the stories about what he's done and is striving to obey obey him. But really, as far as the areas we are trying to grow and the struggles we have in doing it, it's the same whether you're six or 60, isn't it? We are perpetually seeking to grow and understand who God is and what it means for me to obey him. Robin has often reminded us, and I'm so grateful, that you cannot love someone you do not know. Um, And we certainly can't obey someone rightly whose will we do not understand. 
The way in which we increasingly grow in the knowledge of God is primarily, though not exclusively, but primarily through the intake of his word. That is a lifelong pursuit we'll talk more about in a moment. But we not only receive that word and then kind of move on from it, we apply it in real time. And we seek to grow in our obedience toward God. That's what it looks like to be growing in God's will, to be increasing in the knowledge of God, and to be increasing in our obedience toward God. But lest we think that that is an endeavor that we are entirely called to do in our own strength, Paul clarifies next what the source of this power to do these things is. It says a life pleasing to God is a life that's being strengthened by God's power. That's point number two, being strengthened by God's power. He says in verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. That is a pregnant sentence that reveals both the source of Christian power and the purpose of it. And of course, the source of Christian power is not our strength, but God's. He says his prayer is that they and therefore we would be filled with all power according to what? According to his glorious might. Friend, you may have all the knowledge of God's will in the world, but if you are trying to live the Christian life by simply trying harder to do better, the question is not if you will spiritually burn out, but when. The way we live this new life in Christ is by drawing from his power, not our own. Jesus does not save you and then say, hey, good luck. Um, Hope you get the hang of this thing soon. I'll keep an eye on you. Um, If you get in a really bad situation someday, feel free to reach out. Now, that sounds foolish, of course, when we say it like that. But isn't it true that it's so often how we live? We try to do it on our own, which looks like going about our days undernourished spiritually because we avoid God's word, overburdened spiritually because we neglect prayer, under-encouraged because we are isolated from Christian friendship. And so we carry more anxieties than we should because we experience less of Christ than we need. And so God gives us these habits of grace, these, these rhythms of life like Bible reading and prayer and worship and, and friendship, not as measures of spiritual performance, but as means of spiritual strength. They are the means by which we access the power of God. And think about that power for a moment. Think about the well we are drawing from when we engage God in these ways. How powerful is God? How's he doing in the power category? We believe, as we've recounted throughout this year, in the Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. He is the one who established and maintains all that we see. And his greatness is unsearchable. And so if that's what's true of of who he is, and if that's the power that he has not only sort of kept to himself, but he's made available to us, it should blow our minds that it's that that we have access to. And man, when you put that in the balance, power of God versus what you bring to the table, uh, it's pretty clear what tips the scales, right? And yet I'm right there with you. Don't we so often live our days As if we just need to try a little harder, get up a little earlier, stay up a little later, and just get it done. And we functionally live without drawing from the power that God is so eager to supply. It does not please God when we, as one part of Scripture says, eat the bread of anxious toil. 
when we strive from one day to the next, again, with more trouble than we ought because we experience less of Jesus than we need. Because God is pleased to strengthen his people. So it grieves him to see us make failed attempts to go it alone. When he has said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's the source of Christian power. And then Paul in the second part of this sentence fleshes out what's that power for. The purpose of Christian power. Starts with four, which indicates purpose. He says it's for all endurance and patience with joy. I love that. What, what's Paul's big, hairy, audacious goal for what you do with this uh, just unexhaustible well of power from Almighty God? What's he want you to do with it? He wants you to be able to live with endurance and patience. Not just by white knuckling it, but with joy. Friends, isn't it true that much of our lives this side of heaven is spent navigating difficult circumstances? And it's tempting as we walk through those things to want out of it all together or to force our way out of it in our own way. Great spiritual power, according to Paul, looks like pressing on despite those things. Pressing on when we are tempted to throw in the towel. Pressing on when we are tempted to get tired for waiting for it to be over with already. So friends, if we pan back and we take that vision of what spiritual power looks like, let's think about who are some of the power, most powerful people you know spiritually. Who are some of the most powerful people in this room? The most powerful people here are not those who are, man, the tank is full. They are ready to walk through a brick wall for Jesus, whatever it takes. They are thriving in every area of life. Now, the most powerful people here are the persistently, chronically ill who keep looking for ways to trust God and abide in him. The most powerful people here are the ones whose lives have not turned out anything like what they dreamed. Their marriage is not what they hoped it would have been. They can't get pregnant after years of trying. Their kids are not thriving the way they longed for. Their careers have taken turns for the worse they never imagined. The nest egg they thought would be there is not. Their circumstances are just nothing like what they expected. And yet they are asking God what it looks like to follow him right where they are instead of where they hoped they would have been. It's one thing to look out over the life you always hoped for and say with the psalmist, truly, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a beautiful inheritance. It's another thing to look out over the ruins of broken dreams and say the first part of that verse in Psalm 16, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. He holds my lot. Therefore, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places and I have a beautiful inheritance. The people who believe God when he says my power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. Now, that does not mean that those of us who are experiencing less difficulty in this particular moment should feel guilty. We should be thankful. But it means that the times we see divine power on most spectacular display are when it fuels us to endure trial with patience and joy. And so, friends, if that's you, I just want to encourage you, God is not too busy for your problems. Avoiding God because you are aware of sin in your life is like avoiding the doctor because you're sick. Uh, avoiding God because you're not quite sure if he can handle it or he's maybe too preoccupied with other things 
is like avoiding your accountant because it's tax season. It's what they do. It's what they're here for. God is not too busy. He is not too angry. He says, come to me and get strength from me. And it brings him glory when we do. Growing Christian life that pleases the Lord looks like being strengthened by the power God supplies. And then third, it also looks like giving thanks for God's grace. A life that pleases God is a life that's full of giving thanks for God's grace. Let me read it to you again in verse 12. He says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. If you are struggling perhaps a bit this morning to have fuel for thankfulness, you look around and you're just not quite sure what there is to give thanks for, Uh, Paul gives us a laundry list of things to reflect on. He gives us four. First, he says, you have been qualified. He says you're qualified for inheritance. God has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. When a a person has passed on and their estate is being handed down to their heirs, it's a question. It's the reason we do things like write wills, to be able to establish who will inherit it, who qualifies to receive that inheritance. Paul is saying that through Christ, God's son, we become God's son and daughters. And therefore, we become co-heirs with Christ. So that what belongs to Christ now belongs to us. We have been qualified to inherit the riches of the kingdom of God. And so this, this kingdom is not a kingdom of mere property or land. It says it's an inheritance of light. Light in scripture is a a picture of the the presence of God. Throughout his word, when he manifests his presence among a people in a particular way, that presence is accompanied by the image, the sense of light. And so when Paul says that's the kind of inheritance that we have now qualified for, he's talking about the ability to stand in God's presence and in particular to stand in it forever with him in eternity. Whatever your circumstances are, you have a future that God has said includes an inheritance with Jesus in his presence, in his kingdom. You've also been delivered. So you've been delivered from the domain of darkness. So the goodness of God's grace is not only a future hope, It's also, to an extent, a present reality. You, at one point in your life, Christian, before you knew Jesus, were bound in sin within that dominion, under that domain of darkness. And Paul is reminding you, you have now been set free. So yes, the presence of sin remains in your life. It remains to an extent in my life as well. But its power has been broken. Sin no longer has dominion over you. So think for a minute about what your life was like before you trusted in Christ. Think about the the sins that enslaved you. Can you see that you are not today who you once were? It's easy to forget if it's been a couple of decades how much God's done. But I don't care if it's been 20 years or two weeks if you've trusted in Christ, you are not who you once were. I had the joy this, just this week of sitting down with two different people who've come to faith in the last six months. And they're pressing on. It's not always easy. They're trying to sort out what it looks like to follow Jesus. But they are both acutely aware they are no longer in the domain of darkness. Because Jesus has set them free. That's true of every Christian in this room. You're qualified, you're delivered, you're also transferred. It says he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. 
So friend, you have not only been delivered out of the domain of darkness and kind of brought up to neutral, and now it's just kind of an even playing field. He's taken you out of one realm of dominion and stuck you inside another one. And he's put you inside the kingdom that is ruled by this beloved son of God, Jesus. And his reign, as we worshiped him for this morning, is not only total, it's good. You live and move and have your being now under the authority of one who loves you and proved it by giving his life for you. How much more so will he now guide you through this life? as you experience it, not under the domain of darkness, but under the domain of Jesus. And then fourth, he says, you've been qualified, you've been delivered, you've been transferred, and you've been redeemed. In whom, this Jesus, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. To be redeemed is to have your debt fully paid. Paul is saying your sin debt, My sin debt has been paid through our union with Christ. When we believed on him and trusted in him, we were united with him. So that Paul can say, you are now in him. And in that Jesus, you have now experienced redemption. So his death for sin is ours. And his resurrection to newness of life and victory over sin is ours. And so the penalty of our sin is paid for and completely forgiven. Friend, whatever your debt once was before the Father, you can know that debt is paid. Jesus paid it all. And now as you walk out your new life in Christ, there is no copay. There's not something else you need to now add to the equation so that you can finish paying it off. You have forgiveness of sins, not because you've made up for sin with your goodness. You couldn't make up that debt if you tried. You have forgiveness of sin because your forgiveness has been secured by Jesus. So Christian, if you're struggling to know what in the world to give thanks for, this is some serious fuel for thanksgiving. You are qualified You are delivered, you are transferred, and you are redeemed. And if you weigh those realities in the balance with your troubles, I think you'll find plenty of reason to give thanks. It's a key part of what the Christian life looks like. If you're asking, what what does it mean to please God? In some ways, these are extraordinary realities. And in some ways, there's a beautiful simplicity to it. And we so often overcomplicate the faith. Pleasing God as you walk day in, day out, looks like increasing, growing, not perfection, but progress, and knowing who he is and what he wants. And then it looks like being strengthened to live that out, not by your power, but by his. And then it looks like giving thanks to him as you do it in light of all that he's done. And so, guys, this morning, as we wrap up a section of Scripture that's, that's Paul praying, I want to stop for a minute and just give us a moment to pray. Because as we think about what are you asking God to do in your life, and I'm sure it's all kinds of things, when you ask him what, uh, he, he, four things for yourself and for others, I think it's helpful to align our vision, align our requests with God's, And ask him to do these things that Paul's been praying for in us. And so I want to close now by just giving you a moment right where you are to pray. And to pray these things that you and I, that your family, that your friends, that this church, that we would be people who grow in God's will, are strengthened by his power, and give thanks for his grace. Take a moment right now and pray, and then we're going to sing.